Hi, everybody. It's a pleasure to welcome you to today's edition of the Into the Impossible podcast. I am your fearful host, Brian Keating, and today I'm talking to a friend and an inspiration, a fellow author, a scientist, a collaborator on the Simons Observatory, which I'm privileged to play a large role in. And that is Catherine, a.k.a. Katie Freeze, who is really an incomparable scientist in that she's incredibly interested both in theoretically understanding models of how the universe began, what it's composed of, how it's evolving, but also deeply invested in how you could detect evidence for or against her own pet hypotheses, including things like in the inflationary universe, the origin of the universe is postulated by what is called natural inflation, her particular model of that, something called dark stars, which are stars made of dark matter. Uh, these are things that could be falsified by evidence, as Katie describes in today's podcast. I think it's really remarkable when we think about someone like Katie, who is as good at communicating the excitement of her results to the public as anybody I know, but also at the forefront of research and leadership within the scientific community, uh, and specifically within the field of cosmology that we work on together. Uh, she's had a storied, legendary career. You're going to learn many things today, including what it was like to be a woman in physics in the 1980s and, and, uh, and then what it's like today, how things have improved her advice to young women which I think also applies to young men and even older men like me as well. Uh, you'll also hear about why you should be very careful in falling too much in love with your own research and why it is incredibly important to, even in these challenging times of COVID and other things, to maintain connections both to your field and to the practitioners in your field. I think that holds equally well, whether you're a cosmologist like Katie or whether you're working uh, in an office or maybe remotely in an office. Stay up to date, follow her advice, stay in touch and enjoy cosmic cocktails whenever possible. And you'll hear about that today. So sit back, enjoy the ride into the impossible with none other than the effervescent, irrepressible, indomitable, incomparable professor. Katie Catherine Freeze. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. I'm speaking to Catherine Katie Freeze, professor now at the University of Texas in Austin, Texas. She is known for many, many things. She is currently the Jeff and Gail Kodoski Endowed Chair of Physics. She's known for her work in theoretical cosmology, particle physics, and astrophysics. I want to give a warning to my audience. Uh, sometimes I, I never dump anything down, but uh, today I'm going to go deep with Katie because uh, how often do I get a chance to talk to someone as brilliant as the phenomenal effervescent Katie Freeze? Katie, how are you doing today? Oh, Brian, thank you. I'm, I'm doing great. It's so much fun to talk to you. You're so kind, so gracious. You read my book. You even gave it an encomia on the back saying that it was at least barely readable. But I want you to know that you were a great influence to me, as you are to many people, not only for your wonderful book, The Cosmic Cocktail, which we'll be talking about today, subtitle Three Parts Dark Matter, but also in your role as a scientist. We're collaborators, and uh, that makes me so happy that we are finally collaborators. A long-time career highlight unlocked to collaborate with none other than Katie Freeze on the Simons Observatory. Well, yay, Brian. Thank you for, <laughs> for making Simons Observatory happen. It's a very cool thing. Yeah, well, a little credit has to go to Jim Simons, but uh, obviously, right for, now he's off the coast of the Galapagos Islands, so I doubt he's tuning in. Uh, Katie, I want to ask you, what appeals to you the most? You've done writing. You've done uh, uh, popularizing of science. If an alien wakes you up in the middle of the night and says, Dr. Professor Katie, who are you? Who are, are you? Are you a mother first? Are you a scientist first? How do you define yourself? if you gave yourself no room for preparation? Whoa, well, that you definitely gave me no room for preparation. Well, I'm going to have, I'm gonna have to, to say more than one thing. So what I love most about my work is research. It's about creativity. It's about fun. It's about collaboration. But I also have to say I'm a mother, and you can't beat that. So that's really up there. 
Yeah. So, and then uh, what do I, what else do I do? A lot of sports. So it's kind of a bigger picture, please. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, I always, I do think of you in all those different roles. I wonder, do you know the etymology of the word matter? Okay. Something to do with the Greeks. It is from the Greek. It's actually from the Latin uh, and it appeals. It's, it actually includes what you oh, just said. It? it means partially means mother. So it partially oh, means mater. Mater. it comes from mater. Yes, exactly. Really? And you are, oh, it's, interesting. yeah, it's very pretty, interesting. Yeah, I thought we'd so start I do off. Mater, so I do mater and matter. <laughs> oh, fun. Absolutely. And I always think, and there's also the notion of mater, like alma mater is like soul mother. So I think of you as the soul mother of modern day dark matter. And I want to talk to you. What transfixes you? What fascinates you about dark matter? The, well, the most fascinating thing of all, of course, is that we haven't yet figured out what it is. So it's a weird universe. It's a cosmic cocktail. It's if you take everything we know about all the stuff, your, you, your body, the walls, the book you wrote, the air around us, the earth we're sitting on, the sun that we depend on for the energy, all of that. Everything is made of atoms, as up to only 5% of the universe. That's a pretty weird thing. And so we have to figure out what's the other 95%, and that is terribly exciting. <laughs> what do you say to those skeptics out there? We're living in kind of a skeptical age, skepticism of experts, skepticism even of science itself. What do you say to a skeptic uh, who says provocatively, you know, Professor Fries, how can you speak so confidently about the past of the universe when you can't even tell me what 95% of the universe is made up of? How would you answer such a skeptic? Well, the, the amazing thing is the huge amount of data that we have that proves that we do understand a tremendous amount about the evolution of the universe. So I would actually, when I think about it, it's pretty amazing because 100 years ago, we knew almost nothing and since the time of Albert Einstein, since the development of general relativity, the progress has just been breathtaking and accelerating. And I'm not talking about the accelerating universe. I'm talking about the accelerating knowledge of, of, what, of, what we've, of what we've learned. So throughout history, there have been creation myths. People want to understand what's around us and why and, and where we go and so on and so forth. And, well, we had one called... Pretty soon after Einstein wrote down his equations, other people applied them to the universe as a whole and came up with this notion of, uh, well, the universe could be expanding, contracting, static, da 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 da. And then, but that, so 1915, Einstein, 1929, Edwin Hubble proved that the universe is expanding. And this is, so anyway, back on creation myths, we have one called the Hot Big Bang, but guess what? It's not a myth. It's right. It's incomplete as can be. But it is just amazing to think in 100 years how much we know. Yeah. When I talked to people recently, I had on uh, Sir Roger Penrose after he won the Nobel Prize. We'll get into the Nobel Prize with your permission later on. But um, I had on Frank Wilczek also recently. And uh, I keep talking about this notion that you know, the science is settled, but only when you look back in reverse, so to speak, you, you make a very convincing case that we do understand a tremendous amount about the creation myth, as you just called it, the hot big bang model pioneered in, in large part by people that you've worked with and that you yourself have contributed to over the last, you know, a few decades. But, uh, but if you look in reverse, we do understand a lot only, you know, back to the first three minutes. But the question I always have, and I always receive you know, what came before that and how much confidence can you have in that? As you know, many people have come up, including Sir Roger Penrose, with alternative actual origins. You know, when the universe comes into and out of existence after these eons, as he calls them, or our friend Paul Steinhardt, who has a model where the universe cycles into and out of existence. But I always point out they always have to have basically a hot big bang within them somewhere. Would you agree with that? Well, the, the, the data go back to 14 billion years ago, and we've just nailed that. There's no, there's no doubt about it. But then if you, if you just, no matter how far back you go, you can keep trying to go farther back, and that is, of course, what we do. And by the way, I have some theories, too. I have one called the phantom bounce, which I'm happy to tell you about. Oh, it's yeah. A, no, please, let's, let's go into it. That's, that's well, fascinating. It's, it's, it's a universe that, well, bouncing in the sense that it reaches a maximum size, 
and then it recollapses and it keeps doing that. And it's driven at the final stages, not now, but down the road by a phantom energy, which means it's a dark energy that have a very, very peculiar properties that is even able to rip apart black holes. So that allows this universe, because normally if you try to do a cyclic universe like that, the black holes eventually eat it up. But if you have this phantom energy, that doesn't happen. But we also can't live with the ordinary Einstein's equations. We have to modify them. And that was something that I was playing around with anyway, the idea that extra dimensions in the universe can give you these modified equations. And so, that, so you know, we need two. Um, I don't like calling them tooth fairies, but we need this phantom energy and we need this, uh, these, these modified equations, and we don't know if that's right. So one of the fun things about the research that I do is that we invent stuff. Mostly it's going to turn out to be science fiction, but you know what? Every now and then it's right, and then and then you do get a Nobel Prize. <laughs> so you've got to try everything you can, and that is just it's really, really fun. But as you said, you know that you know what the big underlying problem is that all of these models, they all have to deal with the question of time, the arrow of time. So in writing down relativistic equations, we treat Space and time as being some being unified, although there's a minus sign in front of the time where there's a plus sign in front of the space. But we don't understand time. And I don't think anybody has a clue at the moment, but someday that is the big one. Yeah, you're, I was talking with Frank Wilczek, who is, I know, a friend of yours, um, and yeah. uh, he has yeah. a very simple definition of time, at least in one sense, but in another sense, it's incredibly complex. And he says time is what clocks measure, uh -huh. and, t and clocks are anything that change. So in principle, the universe can be a clock, our bodies can be a clock, our hearts are clocks. And he talks about the speed of thought, like how many thoughts will you have in a lifetime? How many heartbeats will you have in a lifetime? Well, you can basically uh, quantify those, but yes. Uh, you know, yeah, or what about the psychological clock, which as you know, doesn't necessarily correspond with the clock on your microwave. That's right. <laughs> yeah. And, and this notion of, of, you know, and then complementarity with frequency and time being interrelated, you know, can you have a clock where it only changes once? Or, or as I've asked uh, St uh, Sir Roger Penrose and his, and, uh, his collaborator, late collaborator, Stephen Hawking, I never asked him this, but in a brief history of time, I was really startled to learn that, uh, that that was really written in a sense to, to kind of bolster the theory that he came up with this is Hawking and Hartle, Jim Hartle at yeah. uh, Santa Barbara, where I know you've had a, um, you have a, a visiting appointment or you're on the board of the Kavli Institute. I was, for. I was also a postdoc there. Oh, so, that's right. Yeah. So I got so, to know, and, and Jim Hartle was a faculty member of Chicago while I was a grad student. So I got to know him. Oh, that's right. And so. We had this uh, conversation, you know, what is the, what was the reason that, that Stephen Hawking wrote A Brief History of Time? And then why did he have to write another book called A Briefer History of Time? And I think that really signifies what you just said. There's so many different definitions. Some have better qualities than others for different purposes, but it is, in fact, a relative kind of existence. But I want to get into something specific with you. I think of you when, if, if an alien wakes me up and says, who is Katie Freeze? Not that you care, but I think of incredible creativity. I think of a type of wisdom and creativity mixed together that make you unique. And you're known for many things. You just talked about a new idea, this phantom bounce. You're also known of something kind of mysterious uh, called a dark star. Can we talk a little bit about your, your concept of a dark star that you created? Okay, so I was, uh, so, so yeah, this one is testable. This one's going to be tested. So I always like that. I like to, I like, you know, I, I do a lot of different things. I work, as you said, on the beginnings of the universe, I work on dark matter. But in the end, if you can test it, that makes me really, really happy, which, by the way, is why I joined the Simons Observatory. To, to, but anyway, so dark stars. So it, the very first stars to form in the history of the universe, and that was 200 million years after the Big Bang. Mind you, we are now 14 billion years out, so that's pretty early on. I'm trying not to say pretty damn early on, but anyway, so... <laughs> Don't worry, you can't cur possibly curse more than Ray Weiss did on the show. We, we'll edit it out. Don't worry. Okay. So anyway, so the, the first stars to form in the history of the universe, 200 million years after the Big Bang, very, very early on, they were, well, they are not like the ones that we have today. So they formed inside of proto-galaxies, little smaller things, that are a million times smaller than today's galaxies. And in the middle there, you have a collapsing cloud of hydrogen, gas, and helium. 
And that is all there is in the universe at that point, because the other elements haven't been made yet. So within this collapsing, as this collapsing cloud gets denser and denser and denser, it is at the center of these proto-galaxies, so it pulls in more and more dark matter, and that dark matter ends up providing a heat source. So that if the dark matter is made of a particular type of particle, the weakly interacting massive particle, then those particles are their own antimatter, and when they annihilate with one another, those annihilation products get stuck inside this collapsing cloud, they heat it up, and, well, they provide a heat source for this really, really big, bright thing. So we called them dark stars before we knew how big and bright they were going to be. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, of course, you've not only, you know, inspired different ways to think about them theoretically. I want to actually, let's go there now, Katie. You have a very interesting conjecture. I think you did it with my good friend David Spurgel. Uh, and you talk about it in the Cosmic Cocktail, and that's for a DNA dark matter detector. I just couldn't stop thinking about this as an experimentalist, and I'm a deeply closeted theor theoretical cosmologist too, so I, I take inspiration wherever I can get. Can you talk to, about, uh, talk to us a little bit? First of all, Katie, how do you work? What's your work style? Do you, do you have a way that you can teach the audience members of this uh, Into the Impossible Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination podcast? How can you help us improve our creativity in our imagination? And then how do you do it? How do you come up with so many any ideas and uh, and keep the creative juices flowing. Oh wow! Well, that's a, a. I mean, it's not something you control having an idea, but you can put yourself in in a good setting for it where it might happen. So, I mean, one 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 thing that I do is when when you hear about new results, so then I start reading the papers around them, and then I think, well, yeah, but why didn't they do this or? <laughs> Um, oh my gosh, this is an ingredient that we could use to do something else. And so you just ideas kind of just pop in your head, but you obviously have to know what's going on around you in terms of the research and what other people are doing. And then also I was I remember I was at a conference where people were talking about um, very, very early on about dark energy. Very a bunch of us were in the hallway very frustrated because we thought people are, are too narrow-minded in the way they're looking at this. And so then I don't know, I just was, and then boom, I had an idea, you know? So, and then in the middle, I remember in the conference, looking back at the other two, ah, and they're looking at me, what? <laughs> so, and so you, so if, if you're really, really busy during the semester teaching and taking care of students, blah, 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 it's not going to happen. So you have to have that time to breathe and, and allow the juices to flow. And I'll tell you the other place it happens is in the bathtub. <laughs> <laughs> like Archimedes, like Archimedes. I know, it's by actually the way, true. It's by the way, true. Katie, Jim Simons has a yacht that he is currently sailing on off the coast of the Galapagos <laughs> Islands, and it's called the Archimedes. Oh, okay, I love that. Yeah. Uh, so that's uh, you're in good company with Jim Simons, Archimedes, and uh, many other people. I actually heard that from, I was reading, oh, Avi Loeb. I'm reading his book about uh, Umura Mura, uh, which he claims is an extraterrestrial <laughs> spacecraft visiting our solar system from perhaps a distant solar system launched many years ago. He'll be on the podcast <laughs> next month to talk about that. So stay tuned, everybody. If you're listening out there, uh, do me a favor, give a uh, thumbs up to this on YouTube or uh, give a review on iTunes. Mention what you're learning from Katie Freeze because I learn a lot. And I still feel like the own trait that I have is this relentless passion for, for learning. And learning feels good, Katie. I actually had a psychologist on the show. He gave me some free therapy. He's a famous psychologist at Brown University, my alma mater. And he says that curiosity can be used to break bad habits. So if you smoke or if you overeat like I do, uh, you can actually use the curiosity. Why am I hungry? Am I really hungry? Did I not eat? Am I just emotionally eating? And so he said curiosity can actually help you break addictions because your mind is addicted to learning. And I feel like my audience is like that. I, I see a lot of, I, I don't see any bad addictions in, in your, except the cocktail. Talk to us about uh, the, you know, are we going to become alcoholics if we read this book, Katie? Well, I, I have to tell you that uh, you asked me where another place where ideas, where ideas happen. Okay. So there are the ones that I have by myself, but then a lot of, a lot of them are collaborative. So this is, the, this is the most fun part of my job, 
So I have friends that I like to work with and they're also really fun, silly, creative people. And we sit down and we, we start, we just start talking about what some problem that everybody's trying to solve or whatever. And then, Oh, it's, and most, and then you write down on the back of the envelope, if you try to figure it out and you realize that nah, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. It's not going to work, which is by the way, the thing about dark stars, it took us, it was, that was kind of frustrating. It took us a long time to come up with that idea. And then another year to realize that there, that there were actually stars that shine, you know, mm-hmm. but uh, so where was I going with this? But that was a totally collect, fun, collaborative effort. And, and I had to learn really kind of a, a whole new field because I didn't know too much about stars, you know? So that was, that was really, really fun. Where was I going with this? What question did you I ask? I think I was asking about the DNA dark matter detector at this point. No, you're asking about the cosmic cocktail. Oh, oh yeah. Sorry, you, sorry, yeah. So wait, I was going to tell you about the role of, of, uh, of cocktails. Yes. So, well, believe it or not, that's where some of these ideas do. They, that's where they happen because we all get together, relax and have a few drinks. And that's, and that's when things happen. And so one of them is, um, Andre Druckier is, is, is a, my crazy Polish collaborator who speaks English, French, German, and Polish all at the same time. And, and I, so I met him when I was, I was a postdoc at Harvard, and we were at a, a conference in Jerusalem, and he knew where to go for the New Year's parties, a place called Cinematech. So, and then he started telling me about the work he'd done on detecting neutrinos, on ideas for detecting neutrinos. And then we decided, oh, yes, let's, we, we, we apply this to WIMPs. And so Goodman and Witten wrote the first paper. But then I got Andre to come up to Harvard and work with me and David Spurgle. Okay, that's where this collaboration initially started. And so we wrote the, the pioneering, the first, the very earliest papers that calculated, well, what, what people could see if they were to look for these things. And then we got this whole field going, experiments all over the world. And that's a lot of what I'm describing in, in the book. Mm. Um, and, and now fast forward 20 years and I'm going to answer your question about DNA dark matter detectors. So the, the base, the idea here is with, with the same collaborators, the the idea is that you have a nanometer thin layer of gold, okay, gold atoms. And that means like it's one atom thick. Attached to that, believe it or not, are strands, hanging strands of DNA. And you can buy this from Illumina, Inc. For That's in San Diego, a San Diego company. For 200 bucks. Yep. And I don't remember why they constructed these things, but uh, it's useful. Anyway, so, so you can buy these things. Of course, the, the ones you buy off the shelf are not are too radioactive. You have to get cleaner ones. The idea is, is that you ha- when you have a... The wimps, wimp particles, the dark matter particles come along, they hit the gold, knock a gold nucleus forward into these hanging strands of DNA, and then the gold breaks the, the DNA. So the beautiful thing about DNA is you can control exactly what's hanging there. So you can control um, the different the adenine, guanine, thymine, the different bases. You control exactly where it is. And so therefore you can go identify exactly where the break happened. So you can figure out exactly what path the gold took as it went through the DNA. The and by matter. figuring out the path of the gold, you can go back and figure out the path of the dark matter that, that hit the gold in the oh. first place. Mm-hmm. So that's the idea. Oh, wow. And so has anyone tried to implement this at a large enough scale or are they... No, just mm-hmm. um, so, so far, small prototype tests. So George Church is a famous geneticist, and he has he has a, a small. I mean, we're not going to actually use gold because it, that would get too expensive to have mm-hmm. that much gold. But so and so the DNA strands, and you have to have them hanging straight. So he's put them in a centrifuge, and and that makes them stick out. And so he's done some preliminary tests. So that's as far as it's gotten, and yeah, we we uh, we need to go further with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so another thing that that I've been really fascinated to see is uh, your journey uh, in the field. Obviously, you did uh, incredible research uh, very early on, and you continue to do so. But it's also the inspiration that you have for your many students and proteges. Uh, uh, yeah, I consider myself an informal student of yours, but you've had people. I, I think. Oh, Brian. Jan, I think Jan Eleven <laughs> was uh, was Jana one of your. Uh, she, Jan, Jan Eleven was my very first graduate student. I was an yeah. assistant professor at MIT. She's been a frequent guest. She's been on my show three times already just oh, this she, year. 
she's wonderful. She is. She also has this freeze gene, uh, which is uh, very creative. And she comes up with new ideas uh, to test things that may or may not be visible. And of course, I'm interested in what making the, you know, in invisible visible, as Galileo said. I think I have a little uh, caricature of him somewhere around here on my desk. I've got here's Marie Curie. Here's a little sock puppet I can I got for for the holidays. Um, I'm looking oh, for. Nice. I've got Galileo back here somewhere. But she also uh, is very interested in in making uh, making new ideas visible, as Galileo once said. And I wonder, you know, when you're working with a student, how how is being a mentor to a graduate student similar or different, or, and different from being a parent to your biological children? Say. Thank you for listening to the Into the Impossible podcast or watching it on YouTube. As you know, doctors recommend to stretch your fingers at regular intervals so as not to get any possible signs or symptoms of carpal tunnel syndrome. We have enough to worry about with all sorts of other pandemics running around the world. So exercise your fingers frequently by tapping the subscribe, like, and rating buttons wherever you're listening to this. I read each and every bit of feedback uh, this this past week, I read a feedback that compared this podcast to Lex Friedman's podcast to uh, to Eric Weinstein's podcast. It really fills me with cr tremendous joy. I'm doing this really because I get to talk to people like today's wonderful guest, Katie Freeze. So I'm enjoying it. Help me enjoy it even more. Uh, do your bit. It doesn't cost much, uh, and in return, you might uh, you might be surprised to find out who you're impelling me to invite on the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imaginations Into the Impossible podcast. Please take this moment to like, subscribe, and leave a comment wherever you can. Well, I don't yell at my grad students as often. <laughs> <laughs> at least I hope not. Uh, yeah. Um, I, yeah, I care about them a lot. I want them to do well. Uh, you know, I, I can actually, when they first start out, if they need me to be tough on them, I'll do it. Mm -hmm. And I do it right away so that if, if I feel they're, that they have a weakness, I'll tell them. And in the end, they're grateful for that. But I think one of the things David Spurgel said that really, really reflected, that I reflected on a lot is if you want students, the, the thing that makes students do well is love, that you really, really care. And, and so that's, that's what I try to do. And I also try to get them to think. Rather, what, look, when a student first does their first project, they're, they're, they just do something simple. You, it's actually not easy to come up with a simple project that has a guaranteed paper at the end of it, okay? So that's a really tough thing to do. But you do that, and then in the course of that, you hope that they'll say, oh, yeah, but what about so-and-so? And they'll say, yes, do that. Yes, excellent. And the other thing I try to do is introduce them to lots and lots of people so they can network and learn from other people, hmm. especially because, you know, I have this giant group in Sweden, of all things. So I, I, uh, the Swedish Research Council gave me a very generous grant, $15 million over 10 years, and that means I have a very large group in Sweden. I spend half of the year there. Well, not now because of COVID, but... And so they, 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 they have each, not only each other, but the visitors coming through and da, da, da. I think that interaction, oh, and I bring them to the U.S. to interact with people in, my, you know, in the U.S. as well. And so the networking they get, that is one of the best things I can offer them. Yep. Okay, yeah. Okay, that was a longer answer. I had to think it through, I guess. But, no, that's fine. Yeah, it's a little bit uh, out of left you field. You know, I have to, Brian, can I, take, can I take charge for a minute? Of course. Can I tell you about my background? Yes, I want to hear about it. Okay, this is the Milky Way. Ooh. So at the center... How'd you get so far away to take a selfie? Yeah, yeah. Well, at the center <laughs> is the supermassive black hole. That was the reason for a Nobel Prize for two of our winners this, this year. And then as you move away from the black hole, you see these, this pinwheel, the spiral structure. That's where the stars are. That's where the sun is. And no, it's not getting sucked into the black hole. And that is where the atomic matter is. It's called the disk of the galaxy, but that ain't nothing. What about all the stuff out here? That's the dark matter. And the dark matter does not have this many stars. That's just because it's prettier to have a few stars out there. But you know what? There really aren't very many. And, but we know it's there. You can see it pulling on things. It's, move, it's, it's, uh, it's pulling on stars. It's pulling on gas. It's, it's pulling on light. It lenses light that comes by. So you know it's there. And that's what we have to figure out what it is. 
So I had to show you my background. Yeah, I love is it. Very much related to my work. That's background you won't find on Wikipedia. And actually, one thing that you did very, uh, very uh, significantly is you ruled out a particular type of candidate that is actually literally close to where I am right now at UC San Diego. One of my colleagues, uh, Kim Greist, uh, came up with the name Macho back in the 80s, I believe. It stood for Massive uh, Compact Halo Objects. And you played a role in kind of, uh, not, not out of any personal animosity, but your work basically in part led to the, the, the killing of the macho. Can you talk a little bit about what that's like and why you were motivated to maybe investigate alternatives to machos? Okay, so you, you do realize we're talking here about the machos versus the wimps. Don't, you gotta love it. And, and, and I'm, I'm, I don't know if I'm sorry to say, but the wimps have won. <laughs> so at, at one conference, somebody came up to me afterwards and said, I'm a wimp. <laughs> anyway, so, um, well, the, the, the question at the time was, as you go to lo- lower and lower mass stars, there, you know, there's 20, there's ones that weigh 10 times as much as the sun, da, 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 da. but as you get to a 10th of the mass of the sun, it's well, there's more and more of them. And what if there are just a, what we call a dark matter because, because we can't see it, it's dark, but what if it is stars? It's just, they're so faint that we couldn't see them. Mm. Or you go even lower mass, you go below about a tenth of the mass of the sun, and then you have this, a lot of the same physics going on inside the, inside the objects, but they cannot burn, uh, they, they cannot burn hydrogen, so they, they don't shine. So they still exist, but they just don't shine. So we call them substellar objects. So the question was, well, are there tons of low mass stars or substellar objects? And that was a very reasonable explanation. I remember Martin Rees coming to one of my talks saying, hey, hey, you haven't mentioned this possibility. And I thought, okay, well, let's look at that. And those are the things that are machos. And so we, we looked at a, a bunch of, a combination of data, including Hubble Space Telescope for the substellar objects. It can only be a few percent of the galaxy. So because Hubble could actually see them. Or then you go to lower mass and these things we use, we use a combination of theory and experiment to show that, nope, that's not going to cut it either, that there's, you can't have very many of these things. Mm-hmm. And in fact, now there's a mystery that even the numbers that we, we predicted as, a, you know, as an upper bound, there aren't enough. <laughs> so they're, now they do find them, they shine very, very faintly as well, and there's not enough of them. So that just it didn't cut it. So the, only th- the other option would be, for machos, would be stellar remnants. In other words... When stars run out of fuel, then they collapse, become very dense. The sun will become a white dwarf one day, or neutron stars, or, 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 or black holes for the very heavy ones. And it's still possible that, so we looked at that also, combination of theory and experiment, and, and you could have some percent of the dark matter in the form of white dwarfs, but it just, uh, it didn't work. So, mm. machos are dead. <laughs> That's really looking for wimps. All right. Kim, Kim Grice does not hold a grudge, by the way. He is all for the truth. Um, I want to switch now a different direction and talk about, uh, talk about women in science. And you have said, uh, quote, you were forced to be a trailblazer in the field of astrophysics and cosmology. You never wanted to, but things are definitely improving. Can you talk about uh, what physics was like as a, as a woman uh, maybe when you started your career versus where it is now. You, you know what I found yesterday? A picture from my undergraduate physics class. Okay, so there were 40 physics majors. This is at Princeton, and there were 40 yeah. physics majors. There's usually 20 physics majors. Our class was very weird. There were 40. Wow. Now, let's see if you can find the women. <laughs> I think I see number 17. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> that's and you. Al- and Alice Roos, and that's it. That's okay? it. Wow. Yeah, so... To... So, you know, and the thing is, I went to a high school which didn't have any physics. And so there, I actually went to MIT as a freshman. And there were all these kids who went to Bronx High School of Science and da 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 da. And the, it, the, when the people talk about the climate problems of physics, well, one of them is that I think the boys as well as the girls are very nervous and they're, they're thinking, oh my God, I might not be smart enough to be here. And so they, they talk each other down and they say, this is easy. This is trivial. This is freshman physics. Da 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 da. And you know what? Freshman physics is phenomenally difficult stuff. It's all, it's hundreds of years worth of stuff that's all taught in one semester or one year. It's ridiculous. And so by the end, I went to MIT when I was 16, because you know what? I actually am pretty smart. But at the end of freshman year, I thought I was dumb. Yeah. 
So yeah, it was really, it was really tough. It was really, really tough. So, you know, speaking of that, I had on MIT professor Ray Weiss. I don't know if you ever encountered him. When yes, you were... I'm friends with Ray because I was an assistant professor at MIT too later, you know. Oh, I didn't know that. But yeah, I talked to Ray and I talked to him. I've been asking all the Nobel Prize winners that come on my show. I asked them, do you ever experience the imposter syndrome? Uh, because as you say, you know, it's like freshman physics is really hard because you're getting 700 years worth, you know, from pre Kepler to uh, up until, you know, the large Hadron Collider all in one, all in one semester. And all these Nobel laureates uh, are telling me that they experienced it. At least the experimentalists seem to say it. Barry Barish was the one who alerted me to this. He said, I still have the imposter syndrome. And I said, are you kidding me? You won the Nobel Prize. Like, how could you possibly do it? He said, no, the Nobel Prize made it worse because when he went up to get his medal, he left it in my office, by the way. That's where I got the actual, no, I'm just kidding. That's a piece of chocolate that I probably yeah, got. I have, I have, oh, wait, let me go get mine. I have a bunch too. Oh, okay, go get, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to visit you and eat them out of your house and home. Um, so <laughs> when he went to go collect his award, he said, uh, Barry told me that he had to sign this log that testified that he took delivery of the medal and then he got his check on like, you know, Bob Dylan, who didn't show up for months and months to get his Nobel Prize in literature. Uh, but when he opened this book, the ledger that has the list of all these Nobel Prize signatories, he saw this guy's signature, Albert Einstein. Oh. And he said he got tingled. I'm getting chills now re recollecting this. And, and so did Ray Weiss. And, and then I asked another MIT professor uh, who won the Nobel Prize, I said, Frank Wilczek, did you ever experience the imposter syndrome? He said, oh, no. Quite the opposite. <laughs> Not that he's being arrogant, but that he felt like he was told since he was 22 years old that asymptotic freedom would lead to an eventual Nobel Prize, which he didn't win for 31 years. So imagine the excruciating horror of it. You know, I've heard stories that in the future we'll be able to take a pill and then we'll live forever. And uh, we won't, we'll cure all disease. Let, let's hope that comes someday. But you won't cure accidents. In other words, you could still die. So you'd have this horrible anxiety. You never go out of your house because you might get into a car accident. You know, why would you ever leave if you could just live forever? And I felt like that was probably like Frank. Uh, you know, for 30 years, he just had to stay alive. Of, of course, he kept very busy inventing different uh, dark matter candidates, one of which you had a, a played a big role in, which is the Axion. Uh, if you had to put your money on a dark matter candidate, uh, what would you put that uh, on? If you had to make a bet like Stephen Hawking, uh, we'll, we'll change the stakes of the bet. We won't bet a pornographic magazine, but, but instead, what would you bet the dark matter candidate is? So, you know, I've never been willing to do that because <laughs> what's the point? I mean, nature is what nature is. And I don't, my, my best, my, my hopes do not equal the, the, the truth. The yeah. truth is what it is. So I don't, but what, what do I think is the best motivated? I think the, the wimps and axions are the best motivated. I think that because they're not, we didn't make them up just to solve the dark matter problem, which is what a lot of these new things are. are. They're only there for solving dark matter. That doesn't cut it in my opinion. I think there has to be more, it has to do more than that. And mm -hmm. so and when axions are, are well motivated. So I like that's why I by the way, Frank and Frank Wilczek and I do have a bet. Oh, you do? Yeah, we have a bet because so you know there so there's this Dama data, this Italian group that has hints of dark matter based on annual modulation, namely the fact that the signal goes up and down with the time of year as the earth goes around the sun, which is by the way our idea. That was David Spurgel under Turkey, and I thought of that. So I am highly motivated to want that to be correct, but I don't. I don't think that way. Uh, but, but you know, when they first came out with it twenty years ago or whatever, at this point, that sounded like a bunch of nonsense. But at this point, there is no alternate explanation. There's no single background explanation. So I really do want to know what they're seeing. And there are other experiments made now made of the same material that are testing it. And so we will know within five years. And so Frank and I had a bet that within five years, he bet it's going to be ruled out. And I bet that it's not. And that was, how long? I think it was two years ago now. Okay. And so what did he bet? I think, oh, it was, it was extreme bet. Like he, he, he loses a thousand if I win and he use, I lose one if he wins or something. So he's a wow. fair, he really does not believe in Dama. So I was wow. at least 
Too bad you didn't bet one to a thousand Bitcoin. That would be pretty good. Uh, but yeah, in his previous book, uh, he's got a new book called Fundamentals coming out. But his previous book called A Beautiful Question, which was written in, uh, I believe, 2015, he says that uh, supersymmetry or evidence for supersymmetry will be found at the LHC within five years. So he's got, I think he's got one year left on that. I wish I could have bet him on that because I don't see particular evidence for supersymmetry. No. Sadly, that yeah. Was, that was, yeah, that would have been so great. That's sad. But. I want to go back to Dhamma, but only sort of tangentially. Uh, first of all, I mean, it is being conducted by eminent scientists, one of whom you quote in the book, uh, Rita Bernabe. Bernabe, yeah. Bernabe, and then she is pictured alongside a frequent guest on the Into the Impossible podcast, my friend Elena April at Columbia University. And they're kind of diametrically opposed. But uh, first, I want to ask you, why are so many women attracted to dark matter? Is it is it, I've got Elena, you've got Rita, we have Vera Rubin, obviously. There's you, Jan Eleven. What what is it about? Is it what is what is the dark matter community doing right that other aspects of physics could perhaps learn from? You, you know, when I started to write the book, I wanted to write about the science, and I also realized I want to convey the excitement of doing science. So it's yes. kind of part memoir, part science, you know. But then as I was writing it and I kept featuring women i'm like oh wow i get to show pictures of all these cool women doing cool stuff and maybe young women will get inspired and think oh i can do this too you know and then so i started asking well why are there so many more women in dark matter and i think one of the reasons is that it's you can still do small experiments on the experimental side that one person can run a group starting out with you know 10 or 20 or whatever maybe it'll grow bigger in the end to 100 but it's a small group and so you can you can do it without too much of this kind of macho dynamics that we were talking about earlier that you, you can be the one in charge. Mm. And so maybe, maybe that's the reason, but I don't really know. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. Well, one woman who's playing a role in a huge experiment is, of course, Fabiola Giannotti, uh, who's another well, I Italian. Thought, I, I thought of her as the counterexample. What did I said it? So yeah. there's also... <laughs> It's okay. There's also a lot oh, of Italians. Well, there's, there's, there, there are a lot of Italians in cosmology, men, men and women, and especially more women than in the U.S. Now, one of the problems the U.S. had, and that we're thinking, you asked me about being a woman in physics, where things have drastically improved, is that I was told by the chairman, I, I had a, I arrived pregnant at MIT. I mean, you don't do that. They had to do that before. <laughs> Okay. Well, I, they, I they wouldn't do that. Yeah, I would never do that. A lot. There aren't a lot of women faculty to begin with who show up like this. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> and they actually changed the rules. They, there was no maternity leave. And they even changed the rules on, this, on the Sloan Fellowship that you were not allowed to use it to take time off from teaching, even though the person before me, that's what he'd done. But they made sure I couldn't, you know. And so I, uh, that, was, that was really tough. And... Uh, you know, we didn't, and also the, so childcare, we could barely find any. I mean, it was just, it was torture. And then my, my husband was a postdoc at, at Harvard and the entire salary went to childcare. Mm. But frankly, I think that's why we're divorced because that was such mm. a torture, torture situation. Nowadays, they, pretty much every university has at least minimal maternity leave. And for those who don't want to call it maternity leave, they, they have a, a semester off for all junior faculty or something. I don't care. Yeah, great. I got paternity leave, effectively, oh. you know. Mm -hmm. Oh, God, Brian. And I could, they couldn't even give me once. They said it was a benefit. MIT could not afford to even give me one semester off. Oh, poor MIT. You know, their $20 billion oh. endowment. Yeah, well, I believe them. <laughs> you have maternity leave? Oh, I think that's fabulous. Yeah, I did. Oh. I'm trying to maximize it. I'm trying to encourage my wife to have more it's, kids. But... I was going to say, how many kids do you have? <laughs> <laughs> just, 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 a, just a handful, literally. Um, so wow. I want to, yeah, no, it's, 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 nice. it's amazing. I love it. Nice. I would love to have more, but you know, my role is a lot more limited and time duration at least than, than my wife. Uh, I want to close out by, by just reflecting back on Dhamma, not necessarily, you know, to criticize it or anything, but to say it's, it's unique, at least as far as I'm concerned, that a, uh, an experiment led by eminent scientists from around the world conducts an experiment for you know almost 30 years now acquires data at the you know tw you know 20 sigma level and it's not even that they're not that they're dismissed or something they're, they're almost taken at a level of crackpots in some ways and and i i find that very surprising to me because there are a lot of, i just we just featured one of our collaborators uh, i won't say you know who would actually i can say who it is ichiro kamatsu is a friend of ours you know he just got a tremendous amount of attention for publishing a result that was 2.4 sigma and by the way so that's one of the papers when you 
you're asking about creativity, I started thinking about that. So I'll have an idea. So yeah. my postdoc and I are thinking about it. And I'm not telling. <laughs> oh, you can't, you can't tease it like that, Katie. That's not fair. Come on, oh, give me no, an exclusive no, like, scoop. Ideas don't work. Nine, nine out of 10 don't work. And that's what I want to. If it yeah. works, I'll tell you. All right, later. you'll come back on. All right, you heard it here. Oh, yeah. she, Katie commits or else she gets past to pay me a thousand Bitcoin. So Katie, I've heard uh, with regard to Dama that one of the reasons that people don't trust their result, which is otherwise at a putatively very high level of confidence, much higher than even the Higgs was uh, claimed detected evidence for in 2012, um, that uh, that they won't share their data. When you as a theorist uh, experience those kinds of situations, uh, does that naturally cause you to have a prejudice against accepting those data or is it just against the scientific method and we should we should be more um, forthright with our data? I mean, we I'm guilty of that too. I haven't always shared all my data because it takes a lot of time to put into a, into a not that you can't understand it, but there's a lot of you know dirty laundry in the sense of, well, this is how we calibrate, but then we have a glitch and there's a lot of kind of massaging that we do, especially with low count data. But in there, do you think they could just uh, rehabilitate that, that result by making it making their data public, essentially? So yes, they should have made it public a long time ago. They've had plenty of time, as you said, to massage it. Okay, So there's, it's, it's very unusual, and we don't understand why they don't. Mm -hmm. the, the other reason, so, the pro, so I'll tell you some of the pros and cons. One of the other problems is it's the only experiment that sees anything. Mm -hmm. So the other experiments, such as xenon or lux, these large vats of xenon, they, they have only null results. They see nothing. Mm -hmm. But now the question is, how do you compare DAMA, which is made of sodium iodide, and xenon, which is made of xenon? Right. And in order to do that, that's where the theorists come in. So if you take a certain a particular type of theory, you can make that comparison. And in, this, in the vanilla model, you, you see what you find is that the xenon negative results actually rule out the DAMA interpret interpretation in terms of dark matter. Mm -hmm. However, you've just compared apples and oranges, so that's a very dangerous thing to do. So the beauty is, so you know when I finally got really interested in Frank Calipari of Princeton, who's very, very careful, extremely precision measurement kind of guy, said to me, you know, we have to go test this DAMA experiment. And I thought, oh my God. So he started working on it. He started the Sabre experiment. These are people, oh, the, the other thing is that Dama won't let anybody else buy crystals from the same vendor. So nobody else could get the sodium iodide. Well, guess what? Now three different groups have made their own sodium iodide crystals. And so one of the experiments, Cosine 100, is running. So they'll know in a few years. So we don't have to speculate anymore. No more theory required to compare Xenon versus Dama. Nothing. It's just going to be either right or wrong, which is the origin of the bet I have with Frank Wilczek. <laughs> and... And the other thing is that's the reason that you have to take Dama seriously. When, I, when they first came out with it, people said, oh, it's radon, it's atmospheric muons, it's da 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 that's 10 explanations for what they're seeing. Guess what? It's not any of those things. They've all been ruled out. They can't be right. And here's another weird thing. They're sitting right next to Xenon in the same laboratory <laughs> underground outside of Rome. And Xenon does not see, so if it's some kind of junk, that is infecting Dama, well, then Xenon should have the same junk, and it doesn't. Yeah. So what is said, God's name is going on? That's why I'm really excited to hear these results from Cosine right. 100. Yeah, and if they could do an experiment in the Southern Hemisphere, that would be interesting to me, too. Well, that's uh, going to happen, too. That's where this uh, saber is going to be in Australia. Oh, is that right? Oh, okay, fantastic. Yeah. Okay, Katie, well, we're reaching the end of the time that you have. You're so gracious with your time and your attention. I want to ask you uh, if you're willing to go into the impossible and discuss the final three questions that I ask all of my guests on the Into the Impossible podcast. The first one has to do with looking into the future not about your material will, but as you know, Alfred Nobel endowed a Nobel medallion plus some money, but he had no wife, no children, uh, no direct relatives at all. So he endowed an ethical will that he said his prizes must go to those who have made humankind better. And in that vein, I want to ask you, what kind of ethical or knowledge or wisdom would you most want to leave, not for your material will, but for your ethical will, for people like me who are influenced with, uh, from, by you and want to learn from you outside of what you do in the laboratory? Uh, so I thought about that, and the message I would like to send is to young women. I would like to tell them, don't, if, don't worry about the imposter syndrome. 
because don't think that you're dumber than you are. Believe in yourself. If you have a passion for something, go and do it. So, so I guess that would, that would be my message. And the other thing would be, you can have it all. So Brian, you asked me at the beginning, how do I define myself? And I didn't give a unique definition in terms of one thing. I said, I have, I'm a mater, a mother, and I work on mater, I'm a physicist. And you didn't ask me about all the sports I do. (laughs) You can have as a, you can be a woman in physics and have a wonderful life using your mind with other really fun people and so that's, that's, those are my words to the future. Very nice. That's very nice. Okay. The next question has to do also with the future. And it's either related, if you want, to this monolith that appears in Arthur C. Clarke's 2001 A Space Odyssey, where these primates come upon this monolith in the savanna of Africa, and they don't know what to do with it. And then the monolith appears again on the moon when humanity has advanced technologically to the point it could actually interact with this. And I'm reminded of Richard Feynman. He had this famous cataclysm question. He said, if in some cataclysm, all scientific knowledge were to be destroyed and only one sentence left to capture everything that humanity had learned about the universe, what information, what statement would contain the most information in the fewest possible words? And he had the atomic hypothesis. But I want to ask you, what is Katie Freeze? If you had to summarize on a monolith that would last a billion years, uh, what would you put on such a monolith? So first of all, I have to point out, we missed our chance. There was a monolith in Utah. Oh, but, yeah. <laughs> so what, what I, would, I would put on the monolith a, a, an, a, an, a, something about, okay, on the monolith, I would write about the Big Bang. So 14 billion years ago, the universe started out hot, densely packed, full of tiny subatomic particles that are the fundable, con, fundamental constituents of all matter. Then the universe expanded and cooled to allow matter to collapse into galaxies, stars to form, and life to exist. Very so we understand the past. Now you go figure out the future. <laughs> Very good. Uh, and then the last question that I ask all my guests, now we're going to go backwards in time and ask for some advice to your former self. And that's related to the title of this podcast. As you may know, Arthur C. Clarke had many different sayings. The one is very famous. We opened the podcast with him saying it in his actual voice. The uh, only any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. His second law states that for every expert, there's an equal and opposite expert. And his third law is the only way of discovering the limits of the possible is to venture a little way past them into the impossible. And that's the origin of the name of my podcast. So I want to ask you, what aspect of life was mysterious to a 20-year-old or 30-year-old Catherine Freeze, but now makes sense because you had the courage to go into the impossible? So I have to tell you, when I was in college, I really underestimated the fields of relativity and cosmology. I thought that they were, they were popular with the public, mostly science fiction, not, uh, not the real deal, not serious subjects of attention. So then somewhere along, it's somewhere along. And so I started out actually doing a very different field of physics. And then somewhere along the lines, I heard about big bang nuclear synthesis, Three minutes after the Big Bang, predictions of elements over 10 orders of magnitude that are correct. What? We understand the universe three minutes after the Big Bang? Well, that ain't nothing. I start at that point. I'm like, I got to learn more. And I had my mentor, David Schramm, that I, re- that I met, who taught cosmology. And so all this, my life changed. Yeah. So I have learned to appreciate and, of course, work in some of the most exciting topics that humans could possibly imagine. So don't underestimate what's when when you hear about things when you that that uh, go find out. And I found out that cosmology is the coolest field on earth, <laughs> or in space. Well, Katie Freeze, author of the Cosmic Cocktail: Three Parts Dark Matter. I can't wait till we can have a cocktail together. The last time we had a drink together was at the University of Pennsylvania where we gave a, a public lecture to, to the audience and you signed some books and you signed my other copy. I bought this copy and then you gave me a copy and we did a book swap. I wanna thank you for, uh, for all of the kindness that you've shown me personally with my book, 
with research being a part of the Simons Observatory, bringing in those young people from Sweden and from elsewhere, from Michigan, from Texas now. Uh, you're really an inspiration. You're a mentor and a role model, not just for women, for men, for women, for everybody. And I want to thank you so much for being so gracious and generous with your time. Brian, you're the best. Thank you so much. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic.